Now, um, I'm just going to read something really delicious from this book, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, and it's called The Tree of Knowledge. Just magnificent. Uh, <clears throat> explaining how, um, how our descent into matter and the experiences we acquire with this, um, this fleshly body, with conditioned consciousness, because you see, as we descend through those rings of those planets, we get conditions placed upon us. And they are heavy cloaks, heavy garments that the planets bestow on us. Um, and in effect, they are handicaps, really, obstructions that we have to surmount. So, um, but uh, in our ascent, this is a beautiful little illustration that Alvin Boyd Kuhn uh, uh, makes to um, help one appreciate what's going on. He says, we can conceive the dramatist as desiring to veil the open sense by a playful ruse. Well, he's talking about uh, the, the, this drama, this story of us coming down. He says, much as a rich and indulgent father, head of a great business concern, would offer his son full participation in the enterprise, yet at the start of the son's serious career, he would say to him, uh, you are to be one of us in the management, but lest you try to take hold of your prerogatives before you have mastered all the details of the business, to know the right from the wrong course of procedure, I must send you out into the factory to learn it all from the bottom up. Yeah, sweep some floors, boy. And then when you learn all the you know, the, the mechanisms and, you know, all the procedures, then you'll be fit to uh, sit in my seat one day. So uh, this sums up almost incontestably the gist of the logic of the situation. Let the argumentative chips fall away where they may, and it does bring out rational light when all previous exegesis has left the matter shrouded in Stygian darkness. It may be the final basis of all sanity in our religious psychology to understand that even God cannot give unto his children, beloved children, the bliss and blessedness of divine life without imposing on them the inelectable condition that they earn the right to it by developing the capability for it in the time-tempting mill of evolution. Well said. Alvin Boyd Kuhn, anything you read of Alvin Boyd Kuhn, and this is a must, <clears throat> okay? Who is this king of glory? because he has exposed all of these dramas in here and how Jesus is the sun, S-U-N, of God in the skies. But what it means to us is consciousness. It's also referring to consciousness. It's also referring to our heart chakra. It's also talking about electricity. L, you see, why do you think um, <clears throat> the the light and, and electricity was called electricity with an E-L, you know, L. That's one of the Elohim. Well, because that's where it comes from. Electricity comes from L. Uh, so now just a few other little interesting points. He's got such exquisite language that I just have to read uh, some more of his. The artistry of ancient allegorism caught the world at a low point of its intelligence and mired the interpretive mind in Christianity in the worst slow of misconception ever to afflict the human fancy. Our dullness of comprehension and blank stupidity in handling our great heritage of ancient my mythicism <clears throat> have marred and scarred the face of history. <clears throat> Absolutely true. Bizarre and almost ridiculous as it sounds in the ears of modern people, it can be said truly that philosophy is and must ever be man's true saviour. Yep, so um, <clears throat> Manly P. Hall, the pineal gland. Uh, what does he have to say about the pineal gland? Well, the gland itself is not the third eye, but only the reflection of that organ, its counterpart or symbol in the material constitution. 
It is a relic bearing witness to an ancient faculty. And because it, is en it has endured through these eras of spiritual obscuration, promises the ultimate restoration of the function to which it bears witness. The true power of the gland is in its spiritual counterpart, even as the whole strength of man abides in his visible nature. The true third eye cannot be seen by the ordinary vision, but is visible to the clairvoyant as a vibrant spectrumatic aura surrounding the outer body of the gland and pulsating with an electric light. <clears throat> the first sephira, Keitha, <clears throat> everything I've just showed you, this is what syncretism is all about. There's the Kabbalah, there's all the tarot cards, there's the 22 paths of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, all the alphabets. Here are the planets, there's Mercury, there's Mars, here is the zodiac, Aries in the head, the fire, Taurus in the throat, the earth, Gemini air, Cancer water. This is the whole system. Here's the, uh, the, the Eastern chakra systems. You see? And how they correspond with the Jewish. So this one, gets, this one here gets two. There's two. And this one here, the blue chakra, the throat chakra. And this one. You see, this is supposed to be the pineal gland. And this is supposed to be the two hemispheres, the two hemispheres of the brain. You see, and in this system, there's Keitha. And uh, <clears throat> what he's saying here is Keitha, the crown, signified the pineal gland. And that the next two Sephiroth, Chokmah and Binah, one placed on either side of it, were the two lobes of the cerebrum. Marsilio Ficino was... Um, the guy who translated the Hermetica and the, uh, basically the guy who uh, spoke about the Prisca Theologia and reminded the world of the ancient teachings of Hermes. And um, <clears throat> he spoke a lot about the sun and the planets and how they work. Right? So I'm just going to read a little bit from this book. <clears throat> the first book of the Hermetic Opus <clears throat> contains a story with familiar Gnostic themes. Pymanda, the divine mind, of course, he, this, this is Marsilio, he, he translated the Pymanda. Pymanda is the mind. The twelve, the, this, that's the mind over matter. See, mind is twelve, matter is seven, okay? Uh, so he was the first one to translate it, so he should be able to talk about it. Appears to Hermes, and so divine mind appears to Hermes and describes the origin of nature. God brought forth a demiurge, he relates, a god of fire and breath. Who fashioned seven governors, who envelop with their circles the sensible world. All of the lower world depends upon the seven governors. Then the father God created a man in his own image, a man so beautiful that God fell in love with him. He allowed the man to enter the sphere of the demiurge, and there to behold the seven governors. Obviously the pattern of mankind comes from here. That's what it's talking about. But he allowed that pattern to be introduced into this solar system. Okay? Because uh, that's where the creation happens. It didn't crea it, the creation did not happen here on this earth as literalist uh, evolutionists teach, Darwinians. Or as the theocratic types will teach you, oh God, made Adam from the dust, literally, and Eve from the rib. You know, it's literal to them because they cannot see the three dimensions that are coming up out of this. They can't see those hidden pictures because they're not looking and they don't care to look. They want someone else to tickle their ears in church. Oh yes, priest type, you know, who cares what you do in your private time? Probably, you know, with little boys. They don't care about that. And they offer no protection to their children when they bring them to church because there is no protection for children in any of the Christian corporate churches because they don't deal with pedophiles in, you know, with, with justice and out there and the law and the police and everything. No, no, it's all in-house. We take care of this in-house because we don't want Jehovah's name to be spoiled. Poor Jehovah. <clears throat>
And, of course, God is concerned about that, isn't he? Well, don't you dob Brother uh, Smith in because he's just raped six boys in the congregation. Don't you do that. I've got a name to protect up here, please. This is how they think, and they love it. I've seen it. I was a Jehovah's Witness for 20, 22 years, and I saw how they treated pedophiles, just like that, just as I have said. It's disgraceful. It's murderous. They are murderers. This, this is what frees. Uh, <clears throat> then the Father God created a man in his own image, a man so beautiful that God fell in love with him. He allowed the man to enter the sphere of the demiurge. That's Kronos, the demiurge. He's the boss of the demiurge, Saturn. And there to behold the seven governors, they too fell in love with him and gave him part of their rule. Finally, the man broke through the circles of the governors to know the power of God himself. And that's what we're doing today. We're learning how to break through the circles of the governors to get to God himself, which is who? None other than you. Because there ain't no God out there but you. It's all us. It's all one. One consciousness. And that's what these guys knew. And they were trying to save us from the division of all the 30,000 Christian denominations that have separated us, Methodist on one corner and Presbyterian. And they all say, oh, it's good to have the churches in our community because it brings unity into the, into the community and it brings cohesiveness and all sorts of Christian values. Really? No. Nah. The opposite. They are very perverse and divisive. And we'll never get any of this, never, until the churches are gone and religion and spirituality returns. <clears throat> Gifted with all of this power and knowledge, the man realised to nature below the beautiful form of God and nature loved him, having seen his beautiful features reflected in the water and his shadow on the earth. The man too saw a form like his own reflected in the water and wished to be united with it, a wish immediately accomplished. Nature and man were united in love. Chaos and Eros. Love and chaos. Thus, mankind has a double nature, mortal in his body, immortal in the essential man. His mortal nature is under the, under the dominion of the planets, but his immortal nature is not. That's reading from page 56 of The Planets Within of Marsilio Ficino. Now, the Red Sea is your blood, Alvin Boyd Kuhn again. Turns up in all the interesting books, this guy, because he writes them. <laughs> and these are the books that you shouldn't read if you go to church, because you'll get all confused and the devil will uh, pull you away from church now, where he will, and he'll deceive you. For if, and he says here, for if Proclus is right, those infinite points of light, those infinite points of light, are the scintillating brain cells of the mind of God. It is declared that a normal human brain has four quadrillion brain cells. We can generously allow God a few quintillions at least. That's what astrology is. It's studying the anatomy of God. God being the physical universe. You see, in, in, in this hermetic system there are two gods. There's the causal God who remains still. And that God there is probably best described by uh, Pseudo Dionysius when he talks about this wonderful cause. Let me just share a little bit from here. He talks about divine names, okay? Because these, he's, this guy is a Neoplatonist of the fourth century and he's not going to put a name on God. You know, the Hindus call it Anama with a privative A in front of Nama. Nama means name. Anama means no name. You don't name this dude. You don't name it. There's no name. If you can name it, it's not him. It's not it. It's something else and you're fooled. Okay, so this is what they say. This is why we must not dare to resort to words or conceptions concerning that hidden divinity which transcends being, apart from what the sacred scriptures have divinely revealed. For if we may trust the superlative wisdom and truth of Scripture, the things of God are revealed in each mind in proportion to its capacities. And the divine goodness is such that, out of concern for our salvation, it deals out the immeasurable and infinite in limited measures. Just as the senses can neither grasp nor perceive the things of the mind, 
just as representation and shape cannot take in the simple and the shapeless, just as corp corpor corporal uh, form cannot lay hold of the intangible and incorporeal. incorporeal. By the same standard, the truth of truth, beings are surpassed by the infinity beyond being, intelligences by that oneness which is beyond intelligence. Indeed, the inscrutable one is out of the reach of every rational process. I can go on. I mean, the divine names is, is full. Uh, this, kind, this is the kind of divine enlightenment into which we have been initiated by the hidden tradition of our inspired teachers, a tradition at one with scripture. So this, this does not conflict with anything in the Bible. It's just that the people who are interpreting it think that it has got nothing to do with each other because they don't understand it. You see? And he's saying divine mind gave it to us. I mean, I read this <coughs> in my first presentation on astrology from Marcus, uh, from um, Firmicus Maternus saying how divine mind through Mercurius Hermes Trismegistus gave us the secrets through careful observation. Many, many years of observing the stars and what they do. So, um, <clears throat> he says, as long as religions cling to the lower rungs of the scale of interpretation of their scriptures, there will be endless points of difference between them. If they lift if they will lift the sense to the upper third and fourth levels, the apparent outer grounds of difference will dissolve in the unity and harmony of a lofty conceptual enlightenment. Here's another great one, Manly P. Hall, the, the occult anatomy of man, in which here he explains that the, um, the holy land is the body. And he exposes all of these in the, from the scriptures. I'll just give you some, some examples. The sacred river is the spinal, ca uh, spinal canal, which has its source among the peaks of the mountains. The holy men in their retreats represent the spiritual sight of the human brain, and there are seven sleepers of the Quran who must remain in the darkness of their caves until the spirit fire revitalizes them. The brain is the upper room referred to in the Gospels where Jesus met with his disciples. And it is said that the disciples themselves represent the 12 convolutions of the brain. It is these 12 convolutions which later send their messages by means of the nerves into the body below to convert the Gentiles or preach the Gospel in the Middle Earth. You see? So Jesus is up here, the king, and the 12 convolutions of the brain. And through the nervous system, he sends his disciples to go preaching to the Gentiles below. And the Gentiles are down here in Sodom and Gomorrah because that bottom chakra where sodomy happens is called Sodom. <clears throat> and the one above is Gomorrah. You see, it's the holy land. The Jordan is here. It's in the head. And the Jordan starts from, the, Jordan starts from the, 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 the feet of Aquarius. You see, Aquarius is pouring down and he starts that river flowing, the Eridanus. And the Eridanus goes all the way to here, to the Pleiades. The seven sisters. <clears throat> Who are the seven sisters? They're everywhere. Those seven just appear everywhere in our culture. Subaru, the Pleiades. It's the pineal gland, right? There it is. And that's the Eridanus. You see, so John the Baptist, January. Janus is John. That's just John. Don't be fooled. This month used to be called the Baptism Month because as the sun climbs up from the 25th of December here, he gets a hell of a baptizing by January the Baptist, the water bearer. And he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he baptizes him in the Jordan. That's the Eridanus. There's a lot of this stuff in here. Okay, I'm not going to be able to dwell much on this, but um, Pythagoras taught... 
on the internet. Or you can go to the Theosophical Society on Russell Street. They have a lot of this Manly P. Hall stuff and uh, most of these guys. You can order it through them. Um, but um, Pythagoras said that, um, that the, head, the head of the human being is where um, the northern stars are. And that's where Cephas is. See, Cephas, right, is in the constellation of Pisces over here. Cephas. That's another name for, in the Bible for the Apostle Peter. Jupiter. Jupiter. Um, <clears throat> that's Peter. Peter. And... Um, and this is the head, you see, according to Pythagoras. And, and, and also on the, throne, on the throne there is Ursa Major from here, you see. They, they all, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, they all are close to the, um, the throne of God, which is all the stars that encircle the northern pole in the northern hemisphere. That's it there. Polaris is right at the top. It's an acupuncture point. Polaris is right here. And the whole system, this is the dome. You see when you go to the Vatican, you see this dome. Well, that's what it's telling you. That's Polaris in the centre. And all the rest is, all of those stars, they don't set. That, in the Northern Hemisphere, they don't set. Just like our Southern Cross does not set. We see it annually in the skies. It never sets in Australia. Right? So the Northern Star, that, that describes a circle, which is 30 degrees from the... Polaris or 30 degrees from the centre. Everything that is 30 degrees from that, that's Mount Meru, Shambhala. That's Mount Zion. That's where Cephas rules. Cephas has his foot on Polaris. He stands there like that for 3,000 years, man, and he rules this particular age that we're in of Pisces. So the spirit not only leaves, but also enters the body through the crown of the head, probably giving rise to the story of Santa Claus and his chimney. Chimney. Yeah, the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Yeah, Santa Claus is always red, white and black, just like that little mushroom. Yeah, because that's what it's all about. Because what does the Amanita muscaria mushroom do? Well, it causes you to have an out-of-body experience. And if you can have an out-of-body experience, what does that mean? That means that you're not your body. Now, they don't want you to know that, do they? The Vatican has spent so much money in putrid, filthy, lying propaganda to make us believe that we are a society of slaves that are our bodies. And those bodies can go out and get a career, get a job, get a sports career. Well, let's pay... Um, you know, let's pay David Beckham uh, $40 million for one year to go to Galaxy, you know, or whatever. So you see all these, these uh, sportsmen who are, you know, who are getting $100 million a year. And then you see two billion of our brothers who are starving to death. And these sportsmen love to get on these uh, Fox, uh, you know, uh, uh, lifestyle shows to show their you know beautiful mansions on you know on, in Double Day Sydney and oh yes I've got a five million dollar house in Australia I've got a six million dollar house in Liverpool and you know some of our Australian uh, soccer players uh, you know do, do this yeah and and I think to myself you buffoons <laughs> you buffoons you think you're your body do you you think you own the molecules that have assembled your house in Double Day do you well this is the sad story for these people who have descended and gotten themselves entangled. Entangled because, you see, when we come down here, we already make our pact not to be deceived by the priest and the salesman on every corner. And you look around, man. You go to the city, Melbourne, you see the, the priest and the salesman. The biggest, the biggest and the best buildings are the cathedrals and the banks. And they work together. The bullion brokers and the, and the, the people who put the spell on the money. They must put their spell on the money and they work together and they always have and this cabal is about to be undone. By what? By our consciousness. All evil destroys itself like a cancer. 
it will eat itself until it is finished and consumed. Just watch how the Rockefellers start killing the Rothschilds and the Rothschilds start killing the Morgans and the Schiffs and the Warburgs and you watch what happens now. You'll see heads are rolling because Saturn here, the guy that they pay so much homage to and harvest his energy to uh, enslave the rest of mankind, is going to give them a bit of justice. <clears throat> um, the two lobes of the cerebrum were called by the ancients Cain and Abel. Cain, Abel. Male, feminine. This guy kills this guy. In fact, that's why they won't let you write with your right hand. You see, because the left brain is masculine and it dominates this hand ruled by Mars. That's Mars, this is Mars. This is the killing hand, you see. If they can get you, and if they see you working with your sinister hand, left hand, they soon smack that out of you in your right and with your right hand, yeah, to keep you really unbalanced, rather than teaching us to be ambidextrous, right? Or perhaps if you're inclined to be left-handed, we'll go for it, and that will balance out the two hemispheres. They want us in here, because this fella, he sees the trees, he don't see the forest, okay? They need the feminine side to do that and have much to do with the legend of the curse of Cain, which is literally the curse of unbalance. You see, this is un the unbalance is happening here where Orion, that's um, Cain, is killing the bull, Abel. Abel is a bull, Abel, Abel, El. And so, and that's what's happening here. The two hemispheres are here in the brain. The human brain is here, you see, and, and, and Cain, Orion, is killing the bull, his brother. And that's the un unbalance, or the spirit of equilibrium. For the murder of the spirit of equi equilibrium, Cain is sent forth a wanderer upon the face of the earth. The spinal cord is an elongation of the brain, and some authorities even claim the cord to be capable of intelligence, throughout its entire length. This cord, is a, this cord is the flaming sword which is supposed to have stood at the gates of the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is in the skull within which is a tree bearing 12 manner of fruit. Remember I said this is the Garden of Eden. It can't be here. This is where all the vital organs are of the body and these are the best of the vital organs. This is the heavens, the earth and hell. Right? Huh? Da, da. And so there is where all the good stuff's happening. In fact, Aries is the mid-heaven. I discussed that in my astrological presentation two weeks ago where this guy explains clearly that the ancients gave us the chart of the universe, the birth chart of the universe. And in that, Aries is the head. Because it is. It's the mid-heaven, rather, not the head. Aries is the mid-heaven. See, in astrology, the mid-heaven is when the sun climbs to that point. And in your chart, it deals with the tenth house. And that's Capricorn. And because Capricorn is where Saturn is. Saturn. So the tenth house, you see, although the houses go down from the ascendant, they go down this way, that'll be the first, second, third, that when you're doing your astrology. To understand the meaning of the house and uh, what it stands for, you have to go this way. So if, you, if your Aries is the first house, which is to do with your life and you, Taurus is the second house, which has to do with material abundance and wealth because of Venus, etc. This one has to do with short trips and brothers. This has to do with family, yeah? This has to do with pleasure, this has to do with illnesses, the house of death, etc. When you get to this guy, that's your mid-heaven. Because when the sun, remember Hercules climbing up to the pillars of Gemini? And he finally gets up there and he slams down those pillars because he's conquered the holy mountain. Well, that's where you get your honours and it happens in Capricorn, where Saturn is. Because Saturn's the old man who does 30-year orbit. No one does a 30-year orbit. Jupiter's 12, Mars is 2, trumps them all. So he stands, he's an old man Kronos, you know, and he stands there and he, he, he's waiting for the honours. That's why I always look at your 10th house in astrology and see what planet is there and what 
goods are there for you to see, you know, how you will be honoured spiritually, not necessarily by the world. You don't need to worry about that. You know, you don't have to get an Academy Award or anything like that because that's, you, you need to um, sell your soul to get to that level, most people. Trust me, 99% of the actors have sold their souls to get to the top there. And one um, clear evidence of that is they're um, totally silent about the fact that they've been manipulated and handled by uh, CIA controllers ever since they entered and sold their souls to Hollywood. They won't tell you that. But there's a few guys getting out there. There's a guy called um, Randy Quaid, the brother of Dennis Quaid, who revealed a couple of months ago about the uh, Star Whacker Club that exists in Hollywood. There's a certain bank or certain banks that go around whacking guys like Heath Ledger, Michael Jackson to get at their estates. You see? And this bank went on record, well, at least Randy Quaid said, you can see this on, on the internet, on YouTube, he said, there's a bank that told me that said, we prefer dead actors, they don't get in the way. What do you think happened to Marilyn Monroe and Elvis Presley and Rudolph Valentino and Dean, uh, James Dean, etc.? People. These, these guys, there's some smart lawyers that have placed themselves in Hollywood and they are there to bring you to fame and glory and then kill you and take your money. That's what they did to Michael Jackson. It was a whack job. Simple as that. There's plenty of proof. But the reason I'm going into that, on down that tangent, is the, is the fact that this is the knowledge that will bring us back to sanity. And this is the one that they are scared of the most. This is the great heresy that has been persecuted for thousands of years. Because this is empowerment. This is unity consciousness. This teaches you how to think. Whereas Rome has taught us what to think because she likes to divide and conquer. And let who, who shall be deceived, let him be deceived. We're here to administer the affairs of God. Because that's what they do. The Vatican administers all of the affairs of God in our courts. When you get a written summons, that's coming from a scribe and notary. A scribe and notary, right? Jesus in the Gospels condemns five classes of people, right? Unless you're aware of it. He's got the um, he's got the um, the Sadducees. I'm, I'm spelling this wrong. I know that. Please don't uh, pay the uh, Pharisees, the scribes. Lawyers and tax collectors. That's it. And who are they? Are they still around? Oh yeah, you better believe it. These guys, scribes, scriver, that's a V by the way, sorry about my bad writing, uh, scriver notary, notaries. That's a writer of indulgences. I've exposed this in other videos of mine. You see the scribes? That's why he doesn't like the scribes. The, the, uh, the Pharisees, these are people that, you know, like your priests and your, your money changers. These are the money ones. These are the law guys. These are the guys who, sti who you know, get big educations to go in, into, into politics. You know, like your John Howards and your, your Rudds and Gillards and these creeps to run us. And you know what? They're lawyers. Oh yeah, they study law because they want to bind you. And they know how to bind you. It's called statutory legislation. It ain't, it, it's not the law of God. <laughs> We're only bound to one law and that is don't hurt anybody. If we are all one, why are they like that? Because they've divided us. This unites. They have divided us. This, the, the elites that are doing this, dividing us, are causing you to have your label, you know, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, Pentecostal. So we will go back to one them too. If this doesn't take over the whole planet in the next 10 years, it's, it's all over. Okay. It's coming back. It will come back. Hermes has always promised to come back and return. Okay? Uh, one only needs to read the, uh, the Lament of Hermes, right, from the Hermetica, uh, where... Hermes predicted, and, and so, did, uh, so did Hesiod, by the way. Actually, I'll read, I'll read these. I, that's why I brought these along, because, um, you know, I, I don't know. I've done all my notes, and I'm happy. I'm, now I'm just sort of leaving this time to sort of deal with 
loose things that I brought along, okay? So, because <clears throat> it all pertains to the, the holy science, as above, so below. When you know above, where all the planets are and what they're doing, you know below, and you know what's going to be happening for you. This is what, uh, um, in Works and Days by Hesiod, he said, um, notwithstanding this, he was talking about the Iron Age, for now truly is a race of iron. He just explained the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, the Hero Age, and the Iron Age. And he says this, And the gods shall lay for sore trouble upon them, but notwithstanding, even these shall have some good mingled with their evils. And Zeus will destroy this race of mortal men also when they come to have grey hair on their temples at their birth. The father will not agree with his ch children, nor the children with their father, nor guest with the host, nor comrade with comrade, nor will brother be dear to brother as aforetime. Men will dishonour their parents and they will grow quickly old and will carp at them, uh, chiding them with bitter words. Hard-hearted they for not knowing the fear of the gods. They will not repay their aged parents the cost of their nurture. For might shall be their right, and one man shall sack another city, another's city. There will be no favour for the man who keeps his oath, or for the uh, evildoer and the violent dealing. Strength will be right, and reverence will cease to be, and the wicked will hurt the worthy man, speaking false words against him and will swear an oath upon them. Envy, foul mouth, delighting in evil, and scowling face will go along with wretched men, one and all." So there's no hope for the Iron Age. Uh, Hesiod said that. In the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says, "...for in the last days there shall be men lovers of violence and, and greedy and uh, slanderous and etc., uh, etc." Et uh, Hermes did that. Now, of course, this is the original. This is the original. And in the Lament of Hermes, he says, uh, No one, I see times to come, no one will pursue philosophy with single mindedness and purity of heart. Those with a grudging and ungenerous temperament will try to prevent men discovering the priceless gift of immortality. Philosophy will, will become confused, making it hard to comprehend. It will be corrupted by spurious speculation. This is long, this is a long prophecy, but Hermes foresaw because he knew the cycle. He knew that the golden age that Saturn bequeathed to Jupiter and then Mars and then Venus and all these planets have taken over and respectively we had, uh, we've been in Jupiter for 2,000 years. Jupiter's now giving back the reins to Saturn. Before that was Mars, there was a lot of wars going on in that time and then Taurus, there was a lot of, you know, bull worship and Mithra and slaying of bulls and the Hindus with their, you know, reverence for the bull, etc. The Egyptians for Hathor. Uh, it, it comes from the age, you see. You honour, you always honour the sign that the sun is in. For instance, during the year, you know, you get to, um, this is what they call uh, Lent, you know, the days of Lent, 40 days. Well, they eat fish, don't they? Because of Pisces. Right, and then you eat uh, lamb, and then you eat beef. It, it, you'll see that. In, you just look at the, the holidays of the religions and what they are observing, and you'll see that it all goes in with above. Everything above dictates what happens below. Everything. Egypt is an image of the heavens, and the whole cosmos dwells there. In this, its sanctuary. But the gods will desert the earth and return to heaven, abandoning this land that was once the home of spirituality. Egypt will be forsaken and desolate, bereft of the presence of the gods. It will be overrun by foreigners who will neglect our sacred ways. This holy land of temples and shrines will be filled with corpses and funerals. The sacred Nile will be swollen with blood and her waters will rise utterly fouled with gore. But I foresee that in times to come, clever intellectuals will mislead the minds of men, turning them away from pure philosophy. It will be taught that our sacred devotion was ineffectual and the heartfelt piety and assiduous service with which the we Egyptians honour Atum was a waste without reward. Egypt will be widowed. 
Every sacred voice will be silenced. Darkness will be preferred to light. No eyes will rise to heaven. The pure will be brought thought insane. And the impure will be honoured as wise. The madman will be believed brave. And the wicked, look at it, like George Bush, you know, turns up, you know, in, in Iraq with a, with a military uniform and hops off the, the helicopter and all these idiots who watch Fox and all those buffoons, you know, Glenn Beck and all those idiots on there spewing forth their vomitous lies and they think, oh, George Bush is a hero, he's a hero. Well, Egypt's just telling us, they're buffoons, <laughs> you know. The buffoons are the ones that are called heroes and the heroes, we put them in mental, mental asylums like Ezra Pound. You know, the true heroes, the true aristocratic, spirit-loving, wise philosophers, they get thrown into mental asylums. That's what it's saying. Knowledge of the immortal soul will be laughed at and denied. No reverent words worthy of heaven will be heard or believed. Nothing will remain of your religion but an empty tale, which even your own children will not believe. Nothing will be left to tell of your wisdom but old graven stones, etc., etc. So you see, Hesiod said it, Homer said it, the Bible says it. It's the dark ages. It's simple, simple as that. These are the dark ages. Iron, there's 2,000 years of iron and a lot of bronze here. We've had basically 5,000 years of the time of Amun. 5,000 years of the time of Amun, which means hidden, according to Stephen Miller. You see? And according to Stephen Miller, he says that uh, Akhenaten, who was around about here, tried to bring back the age of Aten, which was here. This was the age of Aten over here, going back here. Aten, and this is Amun. 5,000 years of darkness, according to the Egyptians, the indigenous wisdom keepers. Now, the philosophers also spoke much about um, what we need to do in our thoughts, our speaking, our actions. Uh, for instance, Epictetus and uh, Seneca, first century uh, philosophers. Marcus Aurelius based a lot of his wisdom on Epictetus's writing. And by the way, these are the two philosophers that most people suspect in history that Christian principles were based on, these guys. Seneca was Nero's philosopher and Epictetus was a contemporary. And there are scholars out there who swear black and blue that these are the two guys. Because when you read, I mean, you read Epictetus or Seneca and you will find principles that leave, leave this book for dead. Absolutely ex exquisite Roman and Grecian philosophy. It's exquisite because it comes from a higher school, it comes from a higher consciousness. They remembered the ancient, the ancients. And if you think they weren't that smart, well, you need to go for a walk down to Egypt and see the, all the, um, the beautiful optical machinery, you know, um, the, 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 the machinery with which they put grooves in those granite rocks and polish those, those rocks and you can see clearly there's abundant evidence, especially in uh, Carmen Bootler's DVD, The Pyramid Code, that they used high-tech machines, optical precision, laser precision uh, um, machinery, stuff that we don't even know about yet. We still have not discovered. It is impossible to make a pyramid like they did. It's absolutely impossible. You can see it. Anyone with a half a, a, half a brain can work that out. It's impossible. Who did it? Well, the higher consciousness, the higher ages did it. And these guys remembered it. I mean, anything you read, I, don't, I mean, I, I don't know where to start, but this, this one of Seneca is um, on anger, mercy and revenge. And how he explains, um, you know, not in a, in a hard and allegorical and confused manner that the Bible does, but in a clear manner, how we can overcome anger. And how we can, you know, improve our spirituality. I mean, I'd love to share something, but uh, I think I'll press forward because what I want to discuss is the diet of the veg of the uh, vegetarian philosopher. Okay, and this is important because remember the word uh, animal. It has to do with um, 
See, the eating of flesh, according to the philosopher, has to do with the shedding of blood. And that's soul, animal. Whereas plants, there's no bloodshed. Uh, Plato. Plato in the Republic urged, the upper, urged that the upper classes should abstain from eating meat. Not only a vegetarian diet was the healthiest option, but growing plants also requires less land than producing animal food. Porphyry, in his book, this is a Thomas Taylor version, right? Porphyry. His four books on abstinence from animal food. You know, they burned his books in the third century, Porphyry, because he wrote against the Christians. And Celsus did a hundred years before him. Those books must be read if you want to understand who, who Christianity really, really is. This false, rubbish, antichrist Christianity on the scene in your churches, in the community. It's absolutely the antichrist because this is the true Christian religion based on science. It's not based on any kind of hocus pocus that they're teaching in the churches. Porphyry said uh, that the, um, the concept of justice should be extended to animals as justice in this case means not to commit unnecessary murder. Most of meat eaters justify their choice by claiming that animals are irrational and therefore not subjected subjected to the same moral rules. But Porphyry refutes this argument by saying that this is not a reasonable thinking as there are humans who lack rationality and yet they are protected by moral rules against murdering solely for being humans. <laughs> Thus Porphyry says that it is not completely accurate to believe that animals are irrational as they have memory, sensations, fellow feeling and prudence. The fact that they cannot communicate proper, properly their reasoning does not mean that they should be treated with, shouldn't be treated with justice. If a person comes from another country and speaks a different language, this person shouldn't be punished because others cannot understand what he or she, she says. Marsilio Ficino, the guy who we just uh, spoke about, the Renaissance master, said, um, he argued that a vegetarian diet could help a person elevate consciousness and purify the body. He encouraged his followers to become vegetarians and abstain from anything that could enslave the senses, such as the kind of bodily pleasures that would, could dominate the mind. Plutarch. Plutarch, on, in his uh, tractate on uh, the eating of flesh, he says, he argued that people are not naturally carnivorous, but, but gluttony makes them cruel, as the desire to please the senses with the taste of flesh becomes more important than the life of other living creatures. Allowing animal slaughter unnecessarily only indicates that men are being dominated by their bodies. In accordance with the Platonic philosophy, Neoplatonists defend that the mind should govern men's principles. As the use of intellect, it is one of the things that differentiate humans from animals. And when the bodily instincts take over, men are usually corrupted. So the only reason why people do not want to give up eating animals is because eating flesh pleases the senses. A true philosopher must be above the senses and must not allow the instincts to overshadow the principles. Leonardo da Vinci, um, in letters exchanged with Friends usually mentioned piety for animals. He was a vegetarian, of course. And it is said that he bought birds at the market only to set them free. As a good Neoplatonist, da Vinci assumed that killing animals just to satisfy one's desires for flesh was absurd. It attests to the incapability of, of having control over the senses. Plato called this kind of behaviour tyranny of the senses. With the intellect, when the intellect learns that something is morally wrong, but the body, the physical body ignores this principle in the name of its satisfaction. Plutarch says, we can claim no great right over land animals which are nourished with the same food, inspire the same air, wash in, drink the same water that we do ourselves. And when they are slaughtered, they make us ashamed of our work by their terrible cries. And then again, by living amongst us, they arrive at some degrees of fam familiarity and intimacy with us. Uh, he goes on to say, a Plutarch, in his essay on flesh eating, if they could now assume consciousness and speak, uh, they might exclaim, O oh, blessed 
and God loved men who live at this day. What a happy age in this world's history has fallen to your lot, who plant and reap an inheritance of all good things which grow for you in ungrudging abundance. What rich harvest do you not gather in? What wealth from the plants, from the, from the plains? What innocent pleasures is it not in your power to reap from the rich vegetation surrounding you on all sides? You may indulge in luxurious food without staining your hands with innocent blood. While as for us, wretches, our lot was cast in an age of the world the most savage and frightful conceivable. We were plunged into the midst of an all-pervading, prevailing and fatal want of the commonest necessities of life from the period of Earth's first genesis. While yet the gross atmosphere of the globe hid the cheerful heavens from view, while the stars were yet wrapped in a dense and gloomy mist of fiery vapours, and the sun, Earth itself, had no firm regular course. Our globe was then a savage and uncultivated wilderness, perpetually overwhelmed with the floods of the disorderly rivers, abounding in shapeless and impenetrable morasses and forests. So what he's saying there is the animal feels, what a time to be alive at this the worst time in which humans just come along and just rip your head off and eat you. Um, that's from the point of view of the animal. Uh, nothing puts us out of countenance, not the charming beauty of their form, not the plaintive sweetness of their voice or cry, not their mental intelligence, not the purity of your diet, their diet, not superiority of understanding. For the sake of a part of their flesh only, we deprive them of the glorious light of the sun, of the life for which they were born. The plaintive cries they utter we affect to take to be meaningless, whereas in fact they are entreaties and supplications and prayers addressed to us by each which way. Is it not the satisfaction of your real necessities we de deprecate. Yeah, sorry, it is not the satisfaction of your, your real necessities we deprecate, but the wanton indulgence of your appetites. Kill to eat, if you must or will, but do not slay me that you may feed luxuriously. So in other words, the animal's saying, you know, I don't begrudge you, you know, you need to eat. But... Um, but must you slay because for your better eating? You've already got eating. There's already food out there. You know, there's cherries and apples and bananas and carrots and pumpkins. Why does blood need to be spilled? This is the, this is the thinking we, we might have to address if, you know, if, if it concerns us. Um, <clears throat> Alas for our savage humanity, inhumanity, it is a terrible thing to see the table of a rich man decked out by those layers of corpses. The butchers and cooks, a still more terrible sight is the same table after the feast. For the wasted relics are even more than the consumption. Have you seen this? I'm privileged to be able, I'm a musician, a professional musician, so I get to do corporate functions, you know. So, you know, you go to a function of, uh, you know, say, uh, a bank, um, break-up party at the end of the year or something, right? And you see all these uh, diners and all these intellectuals that uh, go to celebrate the corporation, you see, and I, and I get to play and watch their behaviour. And I see how much food, you know, they've got the choice of grapes and watermelon and all sorts of carcasses. They bring out fish and they bring out meat and they bring out all sorts of uh, uh, food. And, and as uh, Plutarch says, the... the um, the wasted relics are even more than the consumption. And yet people are starving to death on this planet. These victims then have given us their lives useless, uselessly uh, as other times from the mere niggard, niggardliness. The host will grudge to distribute his dishes and yet he grudged not to deprive innocent beings of their existence. Well, I have taken away the excuse of those who allege that they have the authority and sanction of nature. 
that man is not by nature carnivorous is proved in the first place by the external frame of his body, seeing that, none, seeing that to none of the animals designed for living on flesh has the human body any resemblance. He has no curved beak, no sharp talons, no claws, no pointed teeth, no intense power or stomach or heat of blood which might help him to masticate and digest the gross and tough flesh substance. On the contrary, by the smoothness of his teeth, the small capacity of his mouth, the softness of his tongue and the sluggishness of his digestive apparatus, nature sternly forbids him to feed on flesh. And that's what uh, Sri Yukteswar says in the Holy Science. There's a chapter there on flesh. And it's absolutely not for human consumption. Um, <clears throat> you know, and it really upsets me when people who take the philosophical stance and try to be teachers, you know, in the truth movement and etc., and who um, um, do the opposite you know, and teach that it's, it's beneficial. And I, I know that people are doing this and it just really, really makes me so distraught. It's absolutely not beneficial at all for anything. There's nothing beneficial in eating flesh at all. Not a thing. Nothing. You know, it's, it's toxic. Um, and um, as, as they say, it's, you know, it's, it's a waste of, of soul, animal being soul. But anyway, this is this is the thing that um, this is the thing that is it, one, more one studies and, and and deepens his level of appreciation of the spiritual and the metaphysical of all of this. The more one then sees the need to adapt. You see, there are many things that we can do. Um, now, this this establishment, Magpie House, is dealing with yoga, right? So George. George is teaching yoga, and um, this is this is a physical and spiritual uh, thing to, to practice. It has both benefits. You see, physically the yoga is just a magic for the body, but it's also a spiritual thing. You see, and this is why a lot of uh, churchgoers will say, "Oh, yoga! Oh, that's from the devil, <laughs> right? It's from the devil. Yoga, you know, stretching, stretching, and." and filling your mind with good information is from the devil. Um, but you, you see, this is, these are the, some of the things that we need to, to look at. Um, are we exercising and stretching with the good food that we eat, the good light food? Because raw food, um, and if you can add more raw food into your diet, you get more light, right? Because it hasn't been burnt, cooked, uh, grilled, roasted, fried, or anything like that you see, which actually destroys the enzymes in the food. Um, but, you know, things like yoga is, 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 all about, is all about stretching, you know. It's just getting all the joints moving and stuff like that. Dancing, dancing is a good way to do yoga. You know, grab a partner and do half an hour a day or something like that. Because the more um, light food that you eat, and that's L-I-G-H-T, uh, raw food, the more your body can use, the body can use those atoms because they haven't been uh, destroyed, you know, they haven't lost an element like a, an electron which is what causes free radicals, you see. And uh, processed food is, is, is like that, it, that's why they, they cook it to death, they, they, it's fried and, and, and cooked food is actually destroying the food, the goodness of the food. As you grow with this knowledge of the, and by the way, Prisca Theologia is not saying that only ancient knowledge is, is useful and no, no new stuff. I mean, you know, there's new information that is handy too. It's timeless wisdom. It's not Prisca as in ancient, it's timeless. And as you learn this timeless wisdom, then you grow and you see the need to shed things that you discern for yourself that are no good for you anymore. You see, you might need to eat some fish at the moment and uh, because we, we've had thousands of years of this meat-eating tradition, we've fallen, you see, the tyranny of the senses. And in some cultures they eat humans. They've gone one step further and they've gone to cannibalism, right? They're not satisfied with just eating animals. 
But we fell to that condition. It was not like that in the past. In the past, we did not do this. And I've got proof of that. You know, you've got Ovid in the Metamorphosis 2,000 years ago saying that, please, he's saying to fellow humans, because he was Pythagorean, and they were all... Man, every philosopher was a vegetarian, right? So, um, the great philosophers, that is, all of them. And he says there that, you know, even Empedocles, Empedocles, the Sicilian um, philosopher, he was around the time of uh, Pythagoras. A hundred odd years ago, vegetarians were called Pythagoreans. Yeah, Pythagoreans, yeah. Um, <clears throat> But uh, as, as we go, you know, we can make these decisions for ourselves because you know what you need and you are a priest unto yourself. Simple as that. Um, so no one's, no one's giving anybody any hard and fast rules and I'm, no one's standing up trying to be the best example. I'm not, certainly not, you know, so don't... <laughs> I try to tell people just that I'm not there to give real deep and specific advice of any way to live. I know yoga's good, I do it. You know, I practice my own yoga at home. I do my own stretches and look after. I feel which muscles need, you know, um, a stretch, elong elongation. Where I, uh, you know, I might do a little bit of dancing to relax or, or something like that. Uh, breathing, breathing is very, very important to learn how to breathe. Unfortunately, a lot of people are breathing incorrectly. Right? You see them do this. You know, they suck in here and they breathe in here when they're breathing in. That doesn't make sense. If you blow into a balloon, it expands, right? So when you're drawing in, everything should be just going straight down through the diaphragm, right down the bottom, you know, just it, it should be sort of going all the way down, all the way down to the um, feet, if you can, you know, you envisage the, the breath going down to the feet, almost, and expansion. And then when you, you blow out, oh, then you can contract, you know. But uh, I, I can see people's uh, breathing from, from, you know, a, a long way away. I can see whether they're breathing, breathing correctly or not. That needs to be corrected first because once you can get, um, and there, there, there is a philosophical school that suggests that uh, you've been given a certain number of breaths. Yeah, you've, you've been dished out a certain number of breaths and once they expire, you expire. That's what they say. So they, they teach, and I think it's in the East where they say, so breathe slowly because <laughs> you're going to live long. Yeah. Um, and you'll find most of these geniuses and most of these great inventors, Francis Crick, for instance, discovered DNA on LSD. Okay? This is why the likes of Aldous Huxley and uh, Timothy Leary, you know, advanced the idea that, you know, we need to try some good uh, mind-expanding natural um, plants that have DMT in there. DMT is, is what the pineal, pineal gland produces, you see. Dimethyltryptamine, and it causes you to have visions. This is the visionary eye. Yeah, well, the, the, war, the war on drugs is basically, um, you know, it's, it's a confused war because why would they be attacking plants that are just growing like psilocybin mushroom and plants that have DMT when they should be going after the, you know, George Bush, when he declares a war on drugs, he should be going after, uh, you know, your barbiturates and your, um, and your, um, what, other, what other sort of drugs that are bad, you know, not lumping them in with entheogens, psychedelics and hallucinogens, you know, and, and that's what they're doing. They're doing that because they are the ones who make the drugs, they are the drug traffickers, and they've been exposed many times, so I'm not just making this up. <laughs> you know, George Bush has got a big drug pushing cartel going. And that's why he has his war on drugs, so he can get funding from tax mo taxpayer money for it, so that they've got, you know, big police force, and they're all already taking care of the drug trafficking, and they can use that to disguise their war on drugs to get people who are taking uh, cannabis, for instance, which is a mind-expanding drug. And uh, this is what they do. Yes, they're all very, very clever. Now, just a little bit more. Um, we've got Porphyry now. He says, um, It does not follow, if we have more intelligence than other animals, that on this account they are to be deprived of, deprived of intelligence, as neither must it be said that partridges do not fly because hawks fly higher. Someone, therefore, may admit that the soul is co-passive with the body. 
and that the former suffers something from the latter. It must be demonstrated, therefore, that there is a rational power in animals and that they are not deprived of prudence. And in the first place, indeed, each of them knows whether it is imbecile or strong. And in consequence of this, it defends some parts of itself, but attacks with others. Thus, the, part, the panther uses its teeth, the lion its nails and teeth, the horse its hooves, the ox its horns, the cock its spurs, and the scorpion its sting. But the serpents of Egypt use their spittle, whence also they are called twades, spitters. With this they, are, they blind the eyes of those that approach them, and thus a different animal uses a different part of itself to attack in order to save itself. They likewise change their places of abode at certain times and know everything which contributes to their advantage. In a similar manner, in fishes and in birds, a reasoning energy of this kind may be perceived. So that's what the philosopher thinks, you see. And that's where we need to, we need to uh, well, that's where we're going. This is philosophy, because what is philosophy? Phil means love, and Sophia, she's a goddess of wisdom. Right, Brian? We love this. We love wisdom. Why wouldn't you want to be a philosopher? A lover of wisdom? Or you want to be a doofus? You know, some, the, the dunce on the block? You know. And, and this is the knowledge that grows that. Uh, Lucius Aeneas Seneca, that's the guy who we just uh, spoke about, Seneca. Uh, he was a vegetarian. Um, he said, many dishes have induced many diseases. Note how vast a quantity of lives one stomach absorbs. Insatiable, unfathomable, gluttony searches every land and every sea. Some animals it persecutes with snares and traps, with hunting nets, with hooks, sparing no sort of toil to abstain, obtain them. There is no peace allowed to any species of being. You have a look at those little chickens that are cooped up and they can only face this way. And they've, they've, they've got their, their beaks have been burned off, the pain. You have a look at your cows that have had branding on their faces. Have you seen the movie um, Earthlings by... Uh, narrated by Joachim Phoenix. Please check out Earthlings. I show that one here. It's too graphic. It's too graphic, but it shows how, how what scientists are doing to animals, you know, testing on chimpanzees and injecting them with all sorts of things. I think those animals are just waiting for the morning sun to come through the window so they can be injected with uh, AIDS and, you know, all sorts of things that uh, Bayer and uh, Johnson and Johnson and, uh, and all of these big pharma run by the Vatican. Yeah, you, we don't see it. We don't see what's going on in those laboratories, but you've got little chickens and little guinea pigs and innocent little animals. Plotinus, everyone's favourite. He was in the second century, Neoplatonist, student of Armonius Saccus, I believe. But anyway, this is what he says in his ninth tractate. The intellectual principle, the ideas and the authentic existence. All human beings from birth onward live to the realm of sense more than to the intellectuals, into intellectual. Forced of necessity to attend first to the material, some of them elect to abide by that order and their life throughout make its concerns their first and their last. The sweet and the bitter of sense are their good and evil. They feel they have done all if they live along pursuing the one and barring the doors of the other. And those of them that pretend to reasoning have adopted this as their philosophy. They are like the heavier birds which have incorporated much from the earth and are so weighed down that they cannot fly high for all the wings nature has given them. You know that pelican, right? When he grabs a big fish right, and he tries to get away got too much fish in his mouth, right? He's saying people have, you know, filled their heads with opinions, you know. Oh, and my opinion's right, yours is wrong, and, you know, and I think it should be like this, and it's all heavy with opinion, and they can't fly. Because he says all human beings from birth onward live in the realm of sense. You see, when you trust those five senses, you know, what does it feel like? Mm. 
feels like an elephant, right? <laughs> right, but it could be a, a bear, and, and it's about to you know, eat you. <laughs> uh, you know, you can't trust your senses. You can't trust your sight and your hearing. You know, um, and that's where this mind, the, the sixth sense, this is where. Well, I mean, we have to trust our senses, don't we? <laughs> that's what we've got. That's what the brain. Um, I mean, I'm seeing you by virtue of uh, my eyesight. So my brain's telling you, me that you're there. So I need that so I know who I'm looking at, right? But, um, but these are pure... What, what is seen through the eye is not how, how it really is. It's the reality of appearances, you see. Just your perception and everybody's perception can be different. That's right. Others do indeed lift themselves a little above the earth. The better in their soul urges them from the pleasant to the nobler. But they are not of power to see the highest, and so in despair of any surer ground, they fall back in virtue's name upon those actions and options of the lower form, of the lower from which they sought to escape. But there is a third order, those godlike men who in their mightier power, in the keenness of their sight, have clear vision of the splendour above and rise to it from among the cloud and fog of earth and hold firmly to that other world. Looking beyond all here, delighted in the place of reality, their native land, like a man returning after long wanderings to the pleasant ways of his own country. You see, what they're saying is eventually the godlike one or the one that looks for God, you know, the, um, the cause of it all. He just doesn't satisfy, he's not satisfied with studying effects. He wants to know the causes, you see. Then he returns back to that land uh, after he does uh, mighty searches, he searches for the truth. And, and what is the other place and how it is, is it accessible? It is to be reached by those who, born with the nature of the lover, are also authentically philosophic by inherent temper, in pain of love towards beauty, but not held by material loveliness. You see that pelican, that loveliness of that fish, but it can't fly, so it gets killed. Taking refuge from that in which, if, taking refuge from that in things whose beauty is of the soul, such things as virtue, knowledge, institutions, law and custom, and thence, rising still a step, each to the source of this loveliness of the soul, thence to whatever be above, that again, until the utmost is reached. It's just exquisite. Plotinus is... Um, here is the Nag Hammadi, uh, the Nag Hammadi Gospels, okay? Now... They are hermetic. They talk about Jesus, but not as a historical person, because that's how Jesus should be spoken about. Jesus is not a historical person. Uh, in, um, in the scriptures, he is defined as the Logos. Remember? The Logos. That's where speech... See, this is the, the father, the thinker. And then the Logos speaks forth, and then the Holy Spirit gets sent in Gemini, to go and work, you see? So it's the Logos, it's the wisdom. It's just divine wisdom of Hermes. Everything that Jesus has ever said in any gospel can be taken directly from the mouth of Hermes. That can be proven, and it is. Um, but um, there's a gospel called The Discourse on the Eighth and the Ninth. And that's what I want you, I'm encouraging you to read. The eighth and the ninth. That's talking about the, the eight rings of, um, of the octave that we live in. So they were talking about that science in, in the Nag Hammadi documents. Okay? So I urge you to have a read of some of those if you're interested in knowing who Jesus really is. So we can put all this back into perspective. Because Rome has told us that it's a historical person. And we will only have salvation by that historical person. I've proven with all my videos, not just this one, all my presentations, 
um, that that is wrong. Jesus is, in fact, the, uh, the spiritual essence of who we are. Oh, look, there would have been someone uh, historically that would have taken that name, just like there would be a, a historical Jesus, if, if you like, because the mystery school that was around in the Middle East uh, that was churning out Jesuses uh, was operating until Titus came along and destroyed it. Remember Titus's arch? To, uh, he commemorated the destruction of the Jerusalem and they've got the Jewish menorah, remember that? The arch of Titus that in Rome. Uh, well, he commemorated that, the destruction, because what they did was they destroyed one of the uh, Mediterranean's schools where you could go and be initiated. And in the in initiation, you had to go through ordeals, you see. So they were actually putting people on crosses. <laughs> they were doing it. They used to do this in Egypt. You know, this is why Freemasons, you know, uh, uh, have got all their strange rituals. It's all based on this. This is Freemasonry. And they have to, you know, go through the ordeals just like the sun goes through the ordeals, betrayal and then, you know, blindfolded and then killed and then he's got to climb up and, and, and run away from his enemies, you know. Satan is always there and, and then he's got to conquer and then, you know, there's the sign of exaltation of the sun and here is the sign where etc, etc, right? That's what we do in our ordeals. Now, in the Middle East, that's what they were doing. They were bringing people, you know, they had to carry their cross up the mountain and then they had to be hung on the cross for three days. And when they survived, the initiates, they were given a new name and usually that name was Jesus. There's the, um, the Jesus. That's, that's how it was known. It was not a historical person. It's the spiritual person in you. It's your soul. It's who you are. And then when, once, when one has achieved this uh, illumination, one then is able to have the crown chakra pierced and he is an illuminated chief, an illuminati. There it is. There it is. And that, and that is, you know, the vision that St. John had in Revelation. The moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter and, and Saturn. All described in the first chapter of Revelation where it says, I beheld the Lord and his face shone like the sun. Well, that's the, that's the sun. <laughs> and he had a sword that issued from his mouth. Well, that's Mars. Mars is the martial one. He's ready to fight at the drop of a hat. And he had white hair, you know, because he was the ancient one. Well, that's Saturn, old man Cronus. He's got white hair. It's all grey. He doesn't got any, you know nice dyed hair. <laughs> um, the, the belt around the paps. I mean, what's Jesus doing with, you know, with some nice little boobies? Well, and, and what's he doing with a belt around there, like a bra? So it's a bra, basically. Well, it's Venus. So he's describing in the first chapter of Revelation. And what happens is these, these are the seven vowels of the creation, the seven planets. These are the Elohim. That's the Elohim. He, he was actually describing the Elohim, the, sol the solar system, our big brother as above. Whatever it does, we do. We've got the sun in here. Um, <coughs> Marcillo Ficino has had a lot to say about the sun. I want to share something with you here. The sign in which the sun is exalted, that is Aries. In this way becomes the head of the signs signifying the head in every living thing. Also, the sign in which the sun is domiciled, that is Leo, it is the heart of the signs and so rules the heart in any living thing. <laughs> I'm stressing that because that's what I'm talking about, I'm talking about this um, in all of my presentations, you see. And uh, the reason being is because that's how the system works. Aries is always the head. And the words for Aries have always meant that. In Jewish, Rosh means the head. In Greek, Krios means the head. In Latin, Primus means the head. That's where the Primavera starts, the first season, the spring. Prima, that's Primus. Right? Right ascension begins here. There's a lot of reasons. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> For when the sun enters Leo, it extinguishes 
in many regions the epidemic of the python's poison. Moreover, the yearly fortune of the whole world will always depend on the sun, on the entry of the sun into Aries. And hence, from this, the nature of any spring may properly be judged. Just as the quality of summer is judged from the ingress of the sun into Cancer, or that of autumn from its entrance into Libra, and from the coming into Capricorn the quality of winter is discovered. These things are gleaned from the figures of the heavens present at the time, at that time. Since time depends on motion, the sun distinguishes the four seasons of the year through the four cardinal signs. Similarly, when the sun returns by the exact degree and minute to its place in the nativity of any person, his share of fortune is unfolded through the whole year. It happens in this way because the movement of the sun is the first and chief of the planets is very simple, as Aristotle says. Neither falling away from the middle of the zodiac, as the others do, nor retrograding. You see, all the other planets retrograde. And what's retrograde? Well, you know, if you're watching the planets, you'll, you see Saturn is doing this, then all of a sudden you see him go like this. And then he goes back forward and he goes, he goes direct. So he's, he's transiting a sign and then all of a sudden he goes back a few degrees. And you go, what the hell? And you're watching this, you know? You're, wow. <laughs> I was watching that last year with Saturn in Virgo. Right? It goes all the way to Speaker, then it goes back the other way. In, in Libra, here, Virgo and Libra, Saturn's been here for the last couple of years, right? Uh, so it retrograded, it went back to Virgo, and then it goes back, and now it's in Libra, right? Um, well, it's still physically in Virgo, but anyway, won't go into that because it needs a lot of explaining. <laughs> but um, in our, in our uh, vortex solar system, you see the planets are all doing this, and of course, that's why every orbit is elliptical because they're all occurring in cones. Every orbit. There's not a, an orbit out there that is not elliptical. And because it's doing this, you see, it's conical. So um, what happens is um, uh, when, let's say, this, this will be Earth, here's the Sun, there's Mercury, Venus and the Earth, say we're about here and Saturn is coming around and, and say Mars is coming around here, right? Because we are travelling fast along this way, we are heading in that direction, and Mars is, is going around this curve, he will seem to be going backwards. You see? They don't retrograde physically. They don't sort of stop, you know, and then go back and then, well, that was a good and interesting little retrograde. That was very kinky. They don't do that. <laughs> but um, that's how it works because it's all, we're all following the sun in its cone, and the sun is the leader, and all the planets follow. It's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. It's Little Red Riding Hood. It's Hercules. Samson. Samson pulls down the gates of Gaza. It's Troy. It's, uh, it's uh, Helen of Troy. Helen of Troy is the, um, is the moon. And um, <clears throat> where's my... There it is. Now, this guy, Thomas Taylor, he was interpreting all the, um, all the philosophers, right? And he's the best one. But he's talking about... Um, he's talking about uh, Troy. Of course, you see, we, there, there are scholars who really believe and insist that Troy was physically on the historical plane. It's good when you, when you have intelligent people, you know, shedding the light on, on all of these. You know, like you have... How many books have been written you know, trying to prove that Jesus was historical and etc. and the apostles and everything like that. You know, but then you get um, uh, one great book that comes along, like uh, Alvin Boyd Coons, that one, and uh, dismantles it with proofs. Absolute proofs. Well, what he's saying here about um, the Trojan War, etc., if I can find it, I've got so many good points here. It's just beautiful the way this guy um, explains, explains the myths, you know. Oh, there it is. Of course, it's in um, The Wandering of Ulysses, okay? This is one of the books that he translated. And he says, The Trojans are called genuine. 
Uh, for all the lives which subsist about bodies and irrational souls are favourable and attentive to their proper matter. On the contrary, the Greeks are rational souls. Coming from Greece, i.e. from the intelligible into matter. You see, so it's talking about this. The Trojan War is talking about man and the Greeks, of course, are going to call themselves the, the rational ones coming in and experiencing the experience of matter. Hence the Greeks are called foreign, but vanquish the Trojans as being of a superior order. But they fight with each other about the hel image of Helen, as the poet says, about the image of Aeneas. Helen signifying intelligible beauty, being a certain vessel attracting to itself intellect. An efflux, therefore, of this intelligible beauty is imparted to matter through Venus, and about this efflux of beauty, the Greeks fight with the Trojans, rational with irrational lives. And those indeed that oppose and vanquish matter return to the intelligible world, which is their true country. You see, so when Ulysses spends 10 years returning to his true country, that's 10,000 years of incarnation it's talking about. That's talking about us. 10 is just, a, it's, it's not 10 years literally, it's a symbolic number. Um, according to the, um, as therefore the prophet in the tenth book of the Republic, sorry, and those indeed that oppose and vanquish matter return to the intelligible world with, which is their true country, but those who do not, as in the case with the multitude, are bound to matter. As therefore the prophet in the tenth book of the Republic previously to the descent of souls, announces to them how they may return to their pristine felicity according to periods of a thousand and ten thousand years. Thus also Calchus predicts to the Greeks their return in ten years, the number ten being the symbol of a perfect period. And as in the lives of souls, some are elevated through philosophy, others through the amatory art, and others through the royal and warlike disciplines. So with respect to the Greeks, some act with rectitude through prudence, but others through war or love, and their return is different according to their different pursuits. And that's how they all return back to Greece. Now, the best of the Jewish wisdom that you can get will come from the Sefer Yetzirah and the Zohar. Okay? These books perfectly explain all of this science. Okay. And um, in the Zohar, it's interesting to note in uh, one, of the, um, one of the books, in the chapters in the Zohar, it talks about how to look at the Torah. And in here it, it explains that we must not look at the Bible, the Torah, as a literal document. Because the Jews, the Jews gave us these silly stories on a literal plane, they're silly. But they're wise stories. You know, they're hiding a great kernel of truth. You know, like a silly story like Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men uh, couldn't put Humpty together again. Well, the origin of this is, is very simple, um, you know, to uh, people who are thinking. They don't uh, need to, um, you know, do too, do too much thinking. Uh, that would be a happy egg, wouldn't it? The full moon. And in the ovaries, that would be the egg. Right? So the moon, she climbs up. New moon, she climbs. There's quarter moon, quarter sun. And she keeps waxing. And finally, she gets into her kingdom. She's full and glowing. That's Mary Magdalene. That's Helen of Troy. This is Troy. This is Troy. Right? And when Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall, there's no king that can put it back together again. Because that corresponds to the menstruation cycle. That egg's a goner. Right? So you see, all of the, all of the characters are there. There's not one that is not there. And uh, this is what they're saying in, 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 the, in the Zohar. Um, Woe to the human being who says that the Torah presents mere stories and ordinary words. If so, we could compose a Torah right now with ordinary words and better than all of them. 
In other words, he's saying there's more to it than just ordinary little stories that you can mock. You know, when you hear about Samson killing his thousand with, a, with an ox, and Jonah, um, you know, being um, swallowed by a whale for three days, etc. You know, please don't laugh at us. Even Origen in the, in the second century, the Alexandrian uh, Gnostic Christian said, you know, they're just stories. They are stories that hide a deeper truth. Josephus said it. Uh, Philo Judaeus, um, Philo, the, the great first century scholar, he said that everything in the, in the Bible, in fact, he wrote works called allegory, explaining the allegories in the Bible. The Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4 talks about the allegory of Sarah and Haggai because um, Sarah would be the moon and the moon is the, the mother of spiritual Israel. Right? She would be, she would be Isis. But the earth, Hagar, she is the mother of the slaves because the earthbound people are slaves. Whereas spiritual ones that go to Sarah, you see? And where do you find Sarah? Well, she's on, she's, she's on top of the mountain. They are, that's the spiritual, our spiritual mother, you see? And when Mount Moses cli climbs Mount Sinai, that's the mountain of sin, the mountain of the moon. M another word for moon is sin. And Sinai comes from that word. Um, you see, it says, Fools of the world look only at the garment, the story of the Torah. They know nothing more. Um, Thomas Paine, who was a hermetist, I'm going to wind up in five minutes. Thomas Paine, who was a hermetist and one of the founders of the Republic, of the Hermetic Republic of the United States of America. And he said, as to the Christian system of faith, it appears to me as a species of atheism, a sort of religious denial of God. It professes to believe in a man rather than in God. It is a compound made up chiefly of manism, but with but little deism. And it is near to atheism as twilight is to darkness. It introduces between men, it introduces between man and his maker an opaque body, which it calls a redeemer. As the moon introduces her opaque self between the earth and the sun, and it produces by this means a religious or an irreligious eclipse of light. It has put the whole orbit of reason to shade. The effect of this obscurity has been that of turning everything upside down and representing it in reverse. And among the revolutions it has thus magically produced, it has made a revolution in theology. As to the theology that is now studied in its place, it is the study of human opinions and of human fancies concerning God. That's all it is. You go to church, you go to Jehovah's Witnesses, human opinions buffoons, go to the Mormons, same crap. Seventh-day Adventists, all of them, they've all got their patented version of the same rubbish lie from, from Rome. <clears throat> it is not the study of God himself in the works that he has made, but in the works or writings that man has made. That's what the churches are up to. Yeah. And it is not among the least of the mischiefs that the Christian system has done to the world, that it has abandoned the original and beautiful system of theology, the Prisca Theologia. He knew it. And to make room for a bag, a hag of superstition. And you need to read what, um, what he says. He calls Christianity a dag on the, the spiritual evolution of the human race. A dag, like a sheep has a dag on its bum. That's what Christianity is. It's like a dag dragging us back into the world of superstition. Killing scientists like Galileo Galilei and murdering prophets of this true wisdom. <clears throat> the, age of ignorance, the age of ignorance commenced with the Christian system. But the Christian system laid all waste. 
And if we take our stand about the beginning of the 16th century, we look back through that long chasm to the time of the ancients as over a vast sandy desert it, in which not a shrub appears to intercept the vision to the fertile hills beyond. It is an inconsistency scarcely possible to be credited that anything should exist under the name of a religion that held it to be a religious to study and contemplate the structure of the universe that God made. So it's saying, he's saying that Christianity has been opposed to the study of the universe, how God made it. It's been opposed. That's the enemy, Thomas Paine. That's what caused Teddy Roosevelt to call him a filthy little atheist a hundred years later. Because, of course, of course Teddy was uh, you know, a, a, um, a corporate buffoon who uh, wouldn't know what an atheist is. You know, he, wouldn't know, he wouldn't know what Thomas Paine was anyway. He's just happy to vomit out his rubbish, like all the, all the rest who, um, who came subsequent to the, um, the period of 1871 when they founded the Corporation of the United States, which is not the hermetic republic, constitutional republic of the United States of America. You see, everywhere where Hermes goes, he brings liberation. He did so to the Waldenses and the Lollards and the Huguenots and the Sicinians and the Collegents and the Anabaptists, etc. How many organisations, the, the Bogomils, the Cathars, the Albigenses, the Jews in Spain that were persecuted through the Inquisition. That was eight, nine, a thousand years ago. And uh, then the Renaissance came and they squashed that with the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. And then the Republic came and set itself up. And this is all hermetic. But then the Vatican saw what was happening over in the New Lands and it sent its banksters over to trick people. Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States, says, I killed the banks. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said, uh, democracy is mob rule. We heard what Thomas Paine says. Thomas Paine also says that the Christian religion is a parody on the sun. I've got all those quotes. I've done them in other presentations. So these hermetists tried to save the new world, but the Vatican came, came a calling. After the death of Abraham Lincoln, they set up in Washington, D.C., a corporation called the United States, headed by the Vatican. That's why you have the two fasci in the Congress in America. The fasci belong to Rome. Rome tells you where it's ruling and who it's ruling and sodomizing. It makes fools and slaves out of the world. So this information is the information that frees and I hope that you've enjoyed the presentation and urge you all to, um, to continue studying this stuff. You know, grab, grab a, a book, a notepad and, and, and do this. Do the zodiac, this wheel, this is the wheel that we were blessed with. That's why this is the most known symbol in the universe. This is our science and no one shall take it away from us. It's coming back and it will absolutely free mankind in the very, very near future. And it will destroy the fictions of false religion, absolutely obliterate them. It was prophesied, Hesiod prophesied it. Hermes prophesied it, they all said it. All the prophecies know that when this age comes and Saturn returns in Aquarius, big time truth. He's a truth dealer. Oh yeah, that's why he's got the scythe. He gives you life in truth and he takes it away. Everything is just with Saturn. So um, enjoy the Prisca Theologia and uh, please uh, continue to be prosperous in this information and spread it abo abroad and we can... Uh, help our brothers. And with that I'd like to close and encourage uh, anyone out there who's uh, able to um, understand what I'm trying to achieve with all of this and in particular with the 48 constellations um, that I want to actually get uh, anyone who knows how to do uh, graphics and has equipment and time and is able to help I would really like to uh, reach out to um, anyone out there that can help me to put together a video that will have all of the stories, all of the legends, all of the Bibles and Gospels and mythologies, all of them interpretable by one short journey through the zodiac and the sun going through the zodiac from Aries 
and we'll be able to see all the Bible characters and all the mythological characters in there. This is what I'd like to achieve. So if anyone out there is able to um, donate time and resources and any sort of skills to help me put that together, please contact me at universaltruthschool.com. Thank you.